It's not often that I regret our recording schedule, but I'd like to point out Spider-Man 2 is currently playing in theaters at this moment. Is it now? Yeah, but the showtimes were only for Monday, only at like 7. Oh, that's gross. Right? Right? <laughs> Why do I have to be one of the only people who has something else to do on a Monday evening? <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Welcome to Under the Bridge, everybody. Welcome to Under the Bridge. I'm Cody, a.k.a. the Scarlet Troll. And I am Greg, a.k.a. Greg. And this is our podcast, where we talk news of the pop culture variety. Sometimes comic news, sometimes gaming news, pretty much always movie news, and so- pretty much also always a movie review. Wow. Stumbled on it. <laughs> Good save. And no one would have to know except for the fact that we're referencing it right now. <laughs> Aww. I could still cut it out. Mm. They never have to know that I've ever made a mistake on anything. I mean... <laughs> you don't understand, this editing is a power beyond God. <laughs> <laughs> I literally control the vertical and the horizontal. Oh my god. <laughs> Unlimited power! God, it sounds like me exploring mods in old PC racing games. It's like, wait, you can do this? Ooh. <laughs> wait, that's illegal. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. I can add cards. It's like, well, I mean, I not me. It's more so the people who made these mods from in their free time, some of which rival professional 3D models, but still. <laughs> so, I'm gonna get started. Mm-hmm. A while ago, we talked about Quentin Tarantino's 10th and final film being announced as being a movie called The Movie Critic. Right. That's not happening anymore. Like, it's not his final film, or it's not The Movie Critic? Uh, apparently he is no longer working on that movie, and he's working on something else. Oh, oh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> yeah. I don't understand. I mean, has anyone told this being that he's al- also allowed to make more than ten movies? Right, because, I mean, th- this whole thing is rooted in the idea that he wants to go out, quote, on the top of his game, and that, mm-hmm. I-, I guess the point is it's possible to go on too long, and then the- your last few movies, no matter how great your your other ones were, your last few ones are the ones that get remembered as, oh, wow, you really fell off, huh? But, like... Yeah, yeah, at- fair. In that instance, it doesn't matter how many movies you make. Mm-hmm. Especially not if it takes you forever to make the last one. Yeah, because this has been in production for like a few years now, right? Actually, no, this one this one hasn't been in production, but I mean, his ninth film was... When did, uh... 20, what, 16? 2019 was when Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yeah. So it's been five years since his last one. Mm-hmm. And we, it'll still probably be a couple few more. Okay, yeah. Now, I'm not wishing this on anybody because... Nobody sets out to make a bad movie, and I'd prefer most movies are good. Yes. But what happens if this last one is bad? That would be something, isn't it? Especially with all this man's been... Like, from what I understand, he's been talking a good bit about wanting to only do ten movies, and for, like you said, this his last one to be, like, a really, really good one. As far as I'm aware, most of Quentin Tarantino's movies are generally very well received. Yeah. It would be very funny if he makes this te- last movie, announces, I'm retired from movie making... And it gets, like, universally panned. And I wonder if part of him would go, like, no, I can't leave like this, and goes in and actually makes an 11th movie. <laughs> right, what happens then? Does he stick yeah. to his guns? <laughs> or does he... On one hand, I can see him just sticking to his guns, even if the movie is terrible. But I could also see him also being like, no, I can't leave it like this. <laughs> Bizarre. And I feel a little I feel a little weird speculating on this, but to be fair, the entire point of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is a speculative alternative history, so... Yeah, same thing with Inglorious Bastards, more or less. True. And allegedly, most of his movies are set in a universe where Inglorious Bastards caused that difference. Is that right? Yeah, Hitler dying in a movie theater apparently caused Americans to become obsessed with pop culture. Oh, I never knew that. Part of me hates that, but part of me also thinks that's pretty awesome. <laughs> the exception are movies like From Dust Till Dawn and Kill Bill, which are mm. movies in that universe. In that right? universe, like actual movies that Jules Winfield could walk into a movie theater and go watch Kill Bill. Okay, so I don't want to sound like I'm a hater because I do enjoy, like, from what I've seen of Tarantino stuff, I do enjoy it for the most part. I think the only one that I didn't like fully enjoy was Reservoir Dogs. But holy shit, if that is not some of the most, like, head-up-your-own-ass thing I have ever heard in my life. <laughs> I don't know, as verse building goes, I think it's actually pretty decently subtle. Mm, fair. Case in point, you didn't even know till I pointed it out. You know what? Fair enough. <laughs> I will rescind there. 
this is this is interesting, and I can't wait to see whatever he settles on next. I guess. Y- yeah, it's sad that this whole like movie critic movie isn't happening because I don't know what was told about it. But thinking about Tarantino making a movie called The Movie Critic, I feel like it would just be him more or less being like, "Here's how I feel about the world of criticizing movies in the movie industry." Just shits on everyone, drops the mic, and goes, "I'm out, guys." <laughs> now I want. No, I don't want a movie about the critic. Hmm. But I might want that show back. Fair. Anyways, I was gonna ask if you remember back when Disney was making movies about their theme park attractions, and then I remembered Haunted Mansion came out literally last year, and I still haven't seen it. Yeah, same. (laughs) Space Mountain, though. Wait, is there gonna be a Space Mountain movie? Yes. What? Yes. What? (laughs) What is happening? (laughs) With a script written by Josh Applebaum and Andre Nemec, the team behind... Amazon Prime Citadel and Netflix's Cowboy Bebop. Ooh. Uh. <laughs> Based on a Disney ride. That's. I mean, granted, I haven't watched a lot of the, the Netflix Cowboy Bebop, but that does not exactly fill me with a lot of hope, Look, in all honesty. <laughs> if I have learned anything in the two years I've been doing this and the several <laughs> years before then that I was tracking movie stuff in any capacity, it's mm-hmm. that. This is either going to be the most averagely mediocre piece of garbage. (laughs) Okay. Or this is going to be secretly brilliant. (laughs) There's no middle ground here. (laughs) Maybe it's my cynicism winning over, but I'm personally leaning towards the former in that aspect. Oh, no, the odds are it's horrible, but when you stack this many things against it... Yeah. There's a tiny chance that somehow, it's like adding chemical X to sugar, spice, and everything nice. You might get the Powerpuff Girls out of it. It's just a thing of let them cook, and it's like, you get the Powerpuff Girls, but it's Powerpuff Girls filled with the crushed dreams of, I don't know, the adults who ran that ride as a kid. They're like, oh, boy, they're making a movie out of my favorite ride. And I was just like, oh. <laughs> that might have been a little cold, in all honesty. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much, you get, you get the Powerpuff Girls, or you get a meth lab explosion. <laughs> so there's no room for the Powerpuff Girls in the Meth Lab explosion, then. Oh, uh, I like, hope not. <laughs> no. Well, <laughs> God, I hope not. Yeah, it's like you get Breaking Bad Powerpuff Girls edition. They made a Tomorrowland movie. Did they now? Yeah, I never saw it. Hmm. Didn't really, didn't really scream Tomorrowland to me. Fair. You know? Let's see. I think was... Brad Bird directed it though. Oh, okay. And it starred George Clooney. Yeah, George Clooney, Britt Robertson, Hugh Laurie, Hugh Laurie, Michael G- <laughs> Damn, I might have to watch this movie just for Hugh Laurie alone. <laughs> you know you know what would be really funny? Mm-hmm. When this movie comes out, if we're still doing Cinema Synergy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, to prep for Space Mountain, we watch Tomorrowland. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and Hugh Laurie's the bad guy. <laughs> oh, oh God. All right. I really gotta get better at saying like, comment, subscribe early in. Yes. Because <laughs> I, my brain just went, ah, oh, you should plug the video, and then it went, I should plug the channel. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to the next thing. I say we got channel, we got podcast, we got shorts. <laughs> we do. So, the stars of the original Blair Witch Project. Okay. Heather Donahue, Joshua Leonard, and Michael Williams sent a public statement to Lionsgate, and it's it's a pretty interesting set of asks. Because okay. what they want, because Lionsgate's, I think, working with Blumhouse on a new Blair Witch reboot, and obviously they're not involved. Oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah. Well, because Lionsgate mm. owns the rights. So... Uh, you, you know what, that's fair, yeah. It's it, kind of... But here's what they're asking for. I mean, it's for. not, but it makes sense. in the From a legal standpoint, it's fair. From that's showbiz! <laughs> from an actual standpoint, that's kind of shitty. <laughs> Which is why their requests are... Retroactive and future residual payments to Heather, Michael, and Josh for acting services rendered in the original Blair Witch Project, equivalent to the sum that would have been allotted through SAG-AFTRA had we had proper union or legal representation when the film was made. So, do you want to retroactively get paid for the acting that they did? Residuals. Oh, okay. Presumably, I haven't looked too deep into this, but I'd assume that because it was such a independent niche production, it probably wasn't worked into the contract. Mm, and it sounds like sag after wasn't involved, which I don't know where that stands, all things considered. Yeah, that would be an interesting kind of area to explore, that's for sure. Yeah, 
I doubt anything's ever going to come of this either. Lionsgate hasn't responded yet, and they probably never will, but... Yeah, I, I'm not expecting much, in all honesty, from that. I almost put a news thing on here about how much David Zazzle got paid for 2023, and then I thought, nah, I don't, I don't need to depress myself that much. <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> to continue on, <laughs> their proposal also asked for meaningful consultation on any future Blair Witch reboot, sequel, prequel, toy, game, ride, escape room, etc., in which one could reasonably assume that Heather, Michael, and Josh's names and or likenesses will be associated for promotional purposes in the public sphere. Mm. Which also sounds not crazy. Yeah, doesn't sound crazy to me either. Moderate interruption on, yeah. on that, actually, because I, I looked into the movie a little bit. Did you know that this movie made like $250 million on the box office? I know it was a big hit. I know it was a surprise big hit. Yeah, like, against, like, a $750,000 budget at Jesus! Most. Yeah, in 1990, what was this, 98? No, 99. Party so, time in 1999. Yeah, yeah there's there are a lot of, like, money parties <laughs> from this movie, that's for sure. Oh, those actors probably got paid chump change, too. Oh, I'm so fucking lootly. At that point, they probably got paid nothing. Like, relatively speaking, nothing for it. I mean, thinking about it, that 750 k that probably includes what they all got paid. Yeah. And then, this one I think is the most out there, but I respect it. Mm Mm-hmm. A 60k grant, the budget of the original movie, according to them, Mm. paid out yearly by Lionsgate to an unknown slash aspiring genre filmmaker to assist in making their first feature film. This is a grant, not a development fund, hence Lionsgate will not own any of the underlying rights to the project. There's no way. You're never going to get There's no that. way. I love what they're going for there, but there is absolutely no way they'll agree to that. I respect the hell out of it. Never in a yeah. thousand years. Yeah. No. <laughs> Props to the these actors for trying to prop up an, an aspiring creator. Major respect there, but yeah, that's a little unrealistic of a request in all honesty. If that happens, mm-hmm. for a month in the podcast, after my intro, I will splice in, I'm a big dumb guy. <laughs> and I got the recording there too, so Really? <laughs> well obviously it's recorded. Mm, fair. But no, that's yeah, I'm put I'm pu- I'm putting it down. If that happens, I'll do that. So Lionsgate, if you want to embarrass me, go for it. <laughs> I'll gladly accept that. They don't know I exist. Mm. <laughs> but I kinda like it that way. Yeah, it's just like, man, it would be really unfortunate if it's like, hey, you guys are kind of popular. It's like, yeah, yeah, we are grits teeth. It's like, what do we do? We need an escape plan. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to hear all the shit we've talked about these guys. <laughs> to be fair, I think I've been pretty lenient on Lionsgate. Oh, you know, fair. Yeah, as I say, Lionsgate doesn't come up as far as a topic conversation very much on this show, so. Except for John Wick. Except for John Wick. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever discussed this on the podcast, but... My ultimate goal in terms of fame is mm-hmm. get to the point where some internet music group like Shmo Yoho or whatever takes a bunch of shit that I've said and mixes it into a song. <laughs> I'm not saying I quit when that happens, but that's the ultimate level of fame I'm striving for. It doesn't get much better. It'd be like how the Thanks Obama meme subreddit shut itself down when it's Barack Obama did the Thanks Obama meme. Yeah, that would be the point where I just kick my feet up and go, ah, I made it to the good time. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> and now, there's been some there's been some real stupid statements flying back and forth this week. What? Stupid statements in Hollywood? Perish the thought. <laughs> I didn't want to get into a lot of them. You'll notice, you'll notice that while I dunk on the movies a lot, I try not to get into what Zack Snyder says a lot, for example. Mm-hmm. And there's reasons for that. But this one, and this has nothing to do with Snyder, that was just a premium example of why I try to leave certain stupid statements alone, unless they're coming from an executive, in which case all bets are off. Right. <laughs> but X-Men 97 director Emi Yonemura was talking to Inverse and said that Kevin Feige went back and forth on how X-Men 97 was going to relate to the MCU. And the exact quote is, That has always been something we know was on Kevin Feige's mind. Do we make this part of the MCU? Do we not make this part of the MCU? It's actually gone back and forth quite a few times, and I think we did land in a smart place because X-Men the Animated Series was its own thing, and I think that to continue it, we needed to be our own thing. No shit. And the thing is, people are 
really freaking out about the idea that it was considered. Everybody's like, it couldn't possibly be part of the MCU because it's already canon to Spider-Man the Animated Series, and that's a completely different Spider-Man, so how would that work? Guys, 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 settle down for a sec. Here's the thing. The mm -hmm. Marvel Cinematic Universe is currently neck deep in the multiverse saga dealing with alternate yeah. timelines. You know what else is canon to the MCU? What if? A show that explicitly is not set in the main timeline and deals with a bunch of alternate branch timelines and reimaginings of certain events. When they say, is it canon to the MCU, they are not talking about the main timeline of the MCU. They are talking about, is this going to connect to the multiverse saga in any broader, meaningful way, i.e., are we going to see live-action versions, or maybe even cartoon versions, of these X-Men pop up in Secret Wars, and the answer is probably not, which is a smart choice, but a little bit of media literacy goes a long way. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, I'm kind of surprised it was considered, because it's one of those things where I know, like, my first thought was multiverse and all that, but it's like, not everything that comes out of Marvel in the modern day needs to be connected to the MCU, like, even if it's, like, a broad connection that doesn't amount to anything in the long run. No, absolutely not. A big part of Marvel's multimedia output, especially in the, like, mid-2010s, was mm -hmm. a need to make everything feel like it was MCU-adjacent or inspired. Yeah. And it just, it's limiting. It's so limiting. There's so many yeah. good ideas, so many interesting stories that you can't tell if you're adhering too close to this one iteration of the characters. Go bonkers. Go nuts. Yeah, you're allowed to be creative without being limited to the bigger universe that your company is really honing in on. The main thing is that it has to be a good story. Yeah, and some of those good stories, maybe down the line you could have them like cross universes or whatever and team up for a story or two, but that shouldn't be the main focus. Mm -hmm. But mostly, I just need to set the record straight on this. What do you mean he was thinking about making an MCU? Is he stupid? No, no. <laughs> MCU is just catch-all term for the sacred timeline of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and associated timelines, i.e. Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man is canon to the MCU because he's in No Way Home. He is not canon yeah. to this quote-unquote sacred timeline. I probably don't need to explain this for anybody already listening because you're super cool, but... <laughs> Just the thing from Half-Baked pointing out, you're cool. <laughs> But, you know, if you've got a friend who's hanging on to this, feel free to feel free to point this at him. Mm. Say this rando on the internet says you're stupid and here's why. <laughs> I think we're already ready for trailer time. All right. Wow. <laughs> Damn. All I right. didn't get a lot of news this week. I was, I've been busy. Yeah, I, I know you've been busy. <laughs> Trust me, I'm very aware. All right. Yeah, let's do trailer time. All right. It's trailer time again. We've got movie previews to watch. It's trailer time again. So we got a trailer for M. Night Shyamalan's Trap. So I'm thinking that the guy that's in the basement is actually the serial killer. Huh. I, I don't think it's going to be that. I'm pretty sure the dad himself is the serial killer. But part of my brain goes, it's like... God, that would be too easy, especially if they give that away in the goddamn trailer. But I'm thinking that the guy that is begging for his life on the CCT camera, that's actually the serial killer that the feds are after. Now, it's funny, I've got almost completely the opposite conclusion. I think the daughter's the killer. <laughs> what? What, pray tell? <laughs> I think the daughter's the killer, and the dad's enabling slash helping with it. Maybe you know what? I guy. could... I could see M. Night Shyamalan doing that, in all honesty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like how we both come to completely opposite end of the spectrum twist, because we're both operating under the assumption there has to be a ludicrous twist here. Yeah, absolutely. Although, I will say, if the dad is actually the serial killer in this, he's got that serial killer look and laugh down. <laughs> like, in the last bit of the trailer, when the attendant is just like, it's dope, right? And he's just giving, like, the little maniacal laugh back to the attendant. just like, ooh, damn. All yeah, right, that's he's why got it can't that. be him. Yeah. <laughs> like, he's too good at the serial killer laugh. It's like, nah, nah, it's too easy. <laughs> Boy. That would be something if, like, it's like, who's the serial killer? Oh, the 15-year-old daughter, however old she is. <laughs> It really does suck how knowing that this is a Shyamalan film makes it almost impossible for my brain to engage with it in any way other than what's the twist. 
Yeah, honestly. And for me, it's a thing of what's the twist and please be a good twist or at least a good put together movie. My main experiences with M. Night Shyamalan and his works, at least anything that I can remember, are After Earth and Knock in the Woods. Knock in the Cabin. Knock in the Cabin, which in terms of quality and all that are on the complete opposite ends of the good movie spectrum. <laughs> I, I forget, you didn't see Old, did you? No, I never got a chance to see Old. I heard ah. it was very, very uncomfortable. <laughs> there were definitely some moments. There were definitely some moments. Mm. Yeah. I liked Ish it. <laughs> I liked Ish it. Fair. No, it's an interesting thing where, because the thing is, if I wasn't expecting some kind of bigger twist, I would think, hmm, you know what, this is actually kind of an interesting premise to look for, but it's probably going to be undermined by some kind of weird swerve at the end. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> this man swerves more than the professional drift racer. That's how you drift. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> we also got a trailer for Transformers 1, and I hate most of it. Do you now? Just... I, I actually kind of like this one. <laughs> it's off. Something about it is off. Do you think so? The voices are off. The vibe is off. There are bits that I do like. I like that the vehicles aren't really Earth-ish. Mm -hmm. There, I mean, clearly there's some inspiration there. But when Bumblebee turns into a car, he's not a Camaro. He's some kind of weird space like race space car. Space supercar. A yeah. space car, if you will. S a space car. <laughs> but no, I, I don't like Chris Hemsworth as the Ryan Pax. I don't like Brian Tyree Henry as D16. Something about it is just... It's funny because it's kind of a similar vein with me, as specifically with Chris Hemsworth being a Ryan Pax. On one hand, I'm looking at this movie between this and Furiosa as Chris Hemsworth really, really showing his voice acting chops. Because as I'm watching this, I'm like, there is absolutely no way this is Chris Hemsworth. And he does a great job, especially of like reeling his accent in. And there's even a couple moments, times when he's talking, that he actually kind of does the whole, like, very distinct Optimus Prime deep voice as well. And it's just like, you know what? You are good at voice acting, but I still don't completely like it. <laughs> he's not bad at it. It's not him. It's something about the cadence. It's something about yeah. the dialogue choices. Something about it yeah. just does not click. It feels like... It feels like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem vibes. The problem is that doesn't fit a pre-Earth Transformers movie. Yeah. And for me, part of it is also hurt because it's like, it's falling like Orion Pax and D16 before they become Optimus and Megatron. Oh boy, I wonder how it ends. So that kind of kills a lot of it too, honestly. <laughs> I think there's some good tragedy to get out of that. Hmm. I think that could be interesting to watch on the face of it. It's just, the presentation is off. Hmm. But hey, it looks like we either got the Terracons or the Quintessons or something. I don't, I don't know. I'm not a super huge Transformers fan. Yeah, I'm not either. I just read the Transformers wiki because it's fucking hilarious. <laughs> I know just enough about the lore that I can get brief ideas, but it is not comprehensive. Case in point, I see some weird spacing with tentacles. I think Alpha Q. I see something with spider legs. I think Terracon. Mm, fair. But that's just because of Transformers Prime in the latter case. And the first case is because of Transformers Cybertron. Right. I gotta say, I do like how right after, because I know it came out earlier in the week beforehand, but I saw this trailer immediately following the short you made about me freaking out at, like, Transformers X G.I. Joe. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that's very fitting. <laughs> and if you're confused by that, then you should listen to our previous episode and watch our shorts. That's right, we have shorts. <laughs> yeah. Previous episode, A24, Civil War, and other stuff. Yes. <laughs> and the short G.I. Joe X Transformers. Please watch it. It's got a very low view count. <laughs> Not that I'm desperate or anything. I am. Yeah. <laughs> Probably just like, oh, this looks interesting. Black dude yelling, let's go, and I'm out. It's <laughs> just really loudly. <laughs> Do you want to build a snowman? <laughs> if that's actually slang, I am genuinely amazed by that. <laughs> really? That's going to amaze you. A little bit. Outside of the aforementioned Deadpool movie, if that's a slang for cocaine, and that's something. <laughs> yeah, we also got a trailer for Deadpool and Wolverine. Yes, which is just filled to the brim with all the F-bombs. <laughs> I like this trailer more than I like the first one. Oh, so did I. This one definitely got a lot more laughs out of me, especially Deadpool looking at Wolverine. is like, so, do you want to sit here and talk about your deep thoughts, or do you want to cut to a third act flashback scene? <laughs> <laughs> Go fuck yourself. <laughs> All right, that's pretty good. <laughs> I think it's interesting that we appear to have gotten a confirmation that 
this is not the same Wolverine from the X-Men movies. This is a different mm-hmm. Wolverine. Mm. Which is, I'm not opposed. I'm yeah. not opposed. And that's as somebody who doesn't care about the emotional impact of Logan, because I don't think Logan had much of an emotional impact. Or rather, I think the emotional impact of Logan is so dependent on the mostly shitty X-Men movies that came before it, that when Logan dies, it feels less like a sad moment and more like a mercy kill. (laughs) Me still sitting here in the background being like, I still like this movie. (laughs) I think it's a very well-made movie. I just hate it. Fair. Fair. My thing watching this trailer is definitely, my brain very much went, is like, okay, what is the ultimate payoff for this movie? Because I obviously we know that Marvel is going deep into the whole multiverse thing with the MCU. We literally just talked about that like five minutes ago. But between like the whole like multi-world thing and the fights of referencing different things, and also how horrifically meta this movie is, <laughs> it is a thing of like, okay, I am genuinely very curious about how this is all going to pay off and play out in the last 15 minutes of the film. My prediction is this is going to, because there's, there's, okay, I bet over this part, I know, but technically there's two Secret Wars, there's a Secret Wars 2, and there's Secret War, and none of the, <laughs> Secret Wars are related, and technically the two Secret Wars aren't really super related, no, I guess they both involve the Beyond, the point is, <laughs> I've had this conversation before, I'm going in circles, but hmm. I think the Secret Wars they're most likely to pull from is Secret Wars 2015, which was about the multiverse collapsing and Doctor Doom, although they probably won't use Doom, or maybe they will, who knows, had to scramble mm. to hold it all together on a patchwork planet called Battleworld. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's what they're going for for Avengers Secret Wars, but it's done by Kang or something, or whoever they decide is going to take Kang's place, because apparently they decided if we can't have Jonathan Majors, we might just move away altogether, which is a stupid idea. Point is. Yeah. Yeah, it's a dumb idea. I think what this po- what this movie's going to do is accelerate that collapse. Hmm. Either the TVA's efforts or Deadpool rejecting the TVA's efforts and deciding to do his own thing are going to result in the multiverse being in a far worse state than it was before. Yeah, I could I could see that. And maybe he'll be in the MCU at the end. Maybe he'll only show up when Secret Wars happens and then be on the weird mishmash world and the rebooted reality that's probably going to happen at the end of it because I bet on that horse I don't need to get on it again. Yeah. <laughs> as long as it's not on Comet the Space Horse. Ha <laughs> ha! <laughs> no, only Supergirl's allowed there. Uh... <laughs> at least if you ask Comet. Yeah, uh, fair. <laughs> don't. Don't. Please don't. For the love of Christ, don't. <laughs> don't ask Comet anything. <laughs> don't ask Comet a goddamn thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just imagining, like, <laughs> Comet standing there with a trench coat and a switchblade in his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> just standing in an alley, like, menacingly. <laughs> you want some of this? <laughs> or however a horse name. <laughs> <laughs> Mickey Mouse! <laughs> oh man, this is nothing. This is absolutely nothing. Yeah, no, it, it is nothing, but it's still good. <laughs> Things that I really like in this trailer the giant man helmet with a skull still in it. Mm hmm. That's cool. That's very cool. All the various names for cocaine. <laughs> the Wolverine costume is cool, but I, I don't get why when he ditches the sleeves, he doesn't have the shoulder guards anymore. Hmm. The shoulder guards add an important splash of color and a sense of, I don't know what you call it, but they're aesthetically necessary, you know? I will definitely believe your judgment on that one. Cassandra Nova's here. At least I think that's her. She's not nearly as ugly as she usually is. (laughs) Damn. (laughs) I'm not lying, though. Cassandra Cassandra Nova's usually hideous. What's Cassandra Nova's thing? Okay, so it's important to note, I don't know a lot. What I do know is... She's Xavier's twin. Oh. He tried to kill her. (laughs) Okay. I think in the womb. Oh. She might have been a wall at some point. A wall? Like, wait, a wall? She might have been, like, like in a wall. Wait, do you mean, like, a literal fucking wall? I'm not taking any more questions. That's the extent of my knowledge. (laughs) Bullshit! (laughs) That is literally all I know. She might have been a wall. It's just like, so what's your backstory? I used to be a wall to, to like, a wall to what? I don't know, like, take your pick. Like, a daycare, a hospital, a fucking wawa. I used to be a wall. (laughs) 
I like that Wade's gun has smile, wait for the flash on the edge of the barrel. That was a very good little detail. <laughs> <laughs> I like that a lot. Yeah. All in all, I think this is this has definitely got me more hype than the previous one did, because the previous one was okay, but it was very much based on the appeal of haha, Deadpool interacting with the TVA, Deadpool watching MCU stuff. Ha ha. Mm-hmm. But yeah. this this feels more like the Deadpool movies we've gotten, which are fine. Mm-hmm. Dogpool, I like Dogpool. That's right, we did get do- Dogpool with this, didn't we? Yeah. Licking Wade's face in slow motion while Logan watches in disgust. <laughs> That's very good. Mm-hmm. Liefeld's just feet. That's funny. <laughs> no, I, I'm excited for this one. Yeah. No, this, this sounds like a good time. Or this looks like a good time, rather. I don't know why I said sounds. <laughs> uh, let's go to box office. Let's do the box office. Did we see the highest grossing movie domestically this weekend? You did last weekend. Oh, boy. <laughs> it's still Civil War. Alrighty. But barely. Oh, okay. So what, significant drop off then? Uh, I don't know about significant. $11.1 million domestic weekend for a $44.8 million domestic total. And forty nine point four six million worldwide against a fifty million dollar budget, though. So, mm, that's not good. <laughs> yeah, I still got to make up marketing and all that. And apparently, some of the marketing may have used AI in the posters. So, guys, right? That's A twenty four doing that of all things, bruh. <laughs> if true, disappoint. Do better. Quite. In third place, the movie I saw, Abigail, ten point two nine million domestically this weekend and in total. For a $15.25 million domestic worldwide total. That's against a $28 million budget, so it still has a ways to go. Did you just say a domestic worldwide total? I probably did. <laughs> okay, I was going to say, it's like, is I there a new, it? like, yeah, like a $15 million domestic worldwide total? It's like, wait, is there a new kind of... That was just supposed to be worldwide. Okay, I was going to say, like, is there a new category of film money making that I've never known about until just now? <laughs> nah. Mm. You just got me. <laughs> 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 and then in fourth place, the movie you saw this weekend, Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare, $8.9 million domestic weekend and total, no worldwide information, the budget is 60 mil. Ooh, uh... <laughs> I don't have high hopes there, if I'm honest. <laughs> Before we get into that, though, either movie, really, uh, I just want to say, this isn't a review, but this is a glowing endorsement. <laughs> Oh, right, I forgot about this one. <laughs> the movie Hundreds of Beavers is now available is to amazing. stream and or rent. It's an independent slapstick comedy, and that's all I'm going to say beyond you can yeah. absolutely watch it. It's my favorite movie I've seen this year so far. It's magnificent. It's a masterpiece. Split my sides, couldn't stop laughing. Yeah, it is amazing. <laughs> Anyways, that... <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Oh, God, it's such a good movie. Do we want to start with Ministry or do we want to start with Abigail? Ah, uh, I'll try and knock out Ministry. All right. So, I saw The Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare, a 2024 spy action movie directed by Guy Ritchie. It is a comedic, semi-fictitious telling of the SOE, your Special Operations Executive, engaging in Operation Postmaster, which was a clandestine, very unauthorized mission of the British military to go and knock out some German U-boats before they had a chance to really lock down the Atlantic before the Americans show up. It, this is an interesting one because it's one of those ones where it's like, it's a historically based movie with actual historical figures in it, but it, it still goes full on to like the crazy ass comedy movie side. So that's a fun combination. Henry Cavill stars as Major Gus March Phillips, who amongst many other things was considered one of the people who eventually created the SAS and has been mentioned as being Ian Fleming's inspiration for James Bond. And speaking of which, Ian Fleming is also in this movie played by Freddy Fox. Oh, all right. Yeah, there's actually a lot of interesting figures that are shown in this movie, because to be completely honest, most of the cast outside of Henry Cavill and Isaac Gonzalez are not really people I'm very familiar with, as far as actors and whatnot. So the long and short of this, because I'm going to try and keep this relatively short, Gus March Phillips is in jail. And is, for for reasons that are never really explained, in all honesty. And he has been tasked by the British Army to conduct an operation to travel down to Fernando Po. His mission is to, to take a group of guys to go down and knock out a supply depot for the German U-boat fleet. 
The problem with this, though, is that Ferdinand Poe is under ownership of Spain, which is heavy, heavy air quotes, a neutral country within World War II. Now, officially, Spain did not take part in the Second World War. They were neutral after Francisco Franco took over Spain. But considering that Hitler did actually give the fascist forces in Spain a lot of help and supplies during the Spanish Civil War, even though Spain was officially neutral, there were a lot of pro-Nazi sympathizers within both the government and the military, hence why Germany has this island that they can just do whatever with their U-boats on. So the problem there is that because of the nature of this, Britain at this point is literally on their own in Europe, by the way. Because even though America has officially announced war on Germany, there haven't been any American forces moving their way over to Britain just yet. And it's and the not and this is also the height of the Nazis taking over Europe, by the way. So Britain is like, oh shit, we're on our own. These guys have like the best submarines on the planet to the point where our navy can barely do anything about them. And we have no friends anywhere remotely close to us, so it's looking pretty dire. Hence this operation to knock out the U-boat fleet in the area. It's a very dangerous mission because if Gus March Phillips and his crew are captured by the Germans, they're going to be get tortured and die. If they get captured by the British, they're going to jail because they're conducting an extremely illegal operation in international waters. And that's kind of the basic setup of the movie. This movie is okay. It's not a bad movie by any stretch, but it's not really amazing either. It's definitely a movie that I enjoyed quite a bit because of the historical aspect of it, but it really is just honestly a little mid, which is kind of disappointing in its own right. And it's one of those weird ones where because this is a movie that's based in historical aspects, I'm not sure what counts as a spoiler or not. (laughs) Those are always tough, huh? Yeah. Let's see, what can I say? Well, first and foremost, I will say, like, all the actors, everyone who's involved in this movie does an excellent job. They're all very funny, they're very fun to watch, they're very engaging characters. Roy Kinnar? Kinnar? I might be mispronouncing his name. Kinnar, probably. Yeah. He does a great job as Winston Churchill. Hmm. Yeah. He's great. Gus March Phillips is great. All of his crew is great, and all have very, very interesting personalities and all that. So... There's there's fun times to be had all around. Yeah. Now, I will say, for what it's worth, even though I just said it's hard to figure out what this is a spoiler, it does need to be said, this is not one-to-one, like, historically accurate. Not by any stretch. Of oh, course, that would be is. obvious. Yeah, it never is. There's a lot that's played up to make this movie entertaining and co- and comedic and all that. So in that aspect, don't if you're a stickler for, for historical accuracy, you're not going to have a good time here. <laughs> I would say that this movie is worth it to go to go see because it, it is genuinely a very good time. You get a lot of fun scenes with all the actors and everyone involved. You get to see Nazis get slaughtered, which, hey. I always love that. Yeah, that's always a good time. <laughs> I love watching Nazis get fucked up. Yeah, the only people who don't like wa- watching Nazis get slaughtered are Nazis. So... In the literal sense, not in the having a wild party sense. Yeah. <laughs> I thought to myself... Because after I got out of this movie talking about, like, taking notes and all, I was like, I should go and write down notes about this movie on my laptop. And I actually went to one of my favorite hangouts to do that. And, God, I don't really have anything to write down about this movie. Huh. Yeah, it's weird. Because especially, like, the things that are more worthwhile, that are really, really fun, just kind of also give away the last part of the movie. Because, honestly, the best thing that happens in the movie happens in the final act. Okay. Because there's a little bit of a, not so much a twist, but... A change in plans, shall we say. And it's such a absolutely ridiculous change in plan that's honestly very fun to play out that I honestly don't really want to completely give it away in the, in a spoiler section either. So yeah. Unfortunately, and also not help by me clearly not having my thoughts completed together for this, I don't think I can really give a, a good, worthwhile spoiler section of this because there's just going to be too much stuff to give away that I don't really want to give away with this. So I will say, honestly, go see it. Once again, it's not anything super spectacular, so you're not going to be, like, you know, completely knocked out of your sales or anything like that, but it is a good time. It's pretty funny. It definitely does own up to the comedy aspect of it, and you get to see just gun stuff, soldier stuff, spy stuff, Nazis get slaughtered, just complete World War II tomfoolery, and you get to watch a little comedic movie about 
effectively the creation of the SAS. So, yeah. <laughs> now, this sounds like maybe a little more what someone hypothetically might have wanted the King's Man to be? You know what? Yeah. This is a better King's Man. <laughs> oh, well, I guess to be fair, King's Man was World War One, wasn't it? It was World War One, but I feel like the same feeling does apply to this movie. Especially so since this one is based in an actual historical event. Whereas Kingsman, while using the backdrop of World War I, the main contents of the movie are horrifically fi um, fictionalized. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I would very much say Kingsman, if Kingsman was more focused, if that makes sense. All right, yeah, because I'll, I'll love with you. I don't remember shit about Kingsman except for the post credits. <laughs> and not for a good reason. No, not for good reasons. Man, I'm still upset that I called the final credits just based on one fucking line that the person said at the very end. It's like, oh, god damn it, they're gonna pull- I know who they're gonna pull out. Ah. <laughs> so what are we teasing at the end of our movie? Hitler? <laughs> Hitler? Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> That's the big audience pop, huh? Yeah, it's like, oh god. Because what the, I think, if I remember correctly, what they said is like, because they're talking to- I think it's like the person who would end up becoming Joseph Stalin. Yeah. It's like, you did good work today. Now we need to meet the person who's on the right side of the table. It's like, they're going to say fucking Hitler. They're going to bring in goddamn Hitler. <laughs> and they did. Yeah, and it's just like, oh, you motherfuckers. He's like, can you even try any better? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, go see this. It's, it's a good time. Even though it is kind of mid. <laughs> I might try, but also Sasquatch Sunset is out and I still haven't seen that. Mm, fair. That's fair. I know that's kind of a little bit more up your personal alley. Yeah, a little bit. Speaking of things up my alley, Abigail. Yes. It is a horror comedy directed by Radio Silence, a.k.a. Matt Bettinelli Olpen and Tyler Gillette. Gillette? I'm bad with names. This is no secret. Okay. This is not news. <laughs> I think both of us are bad with names. I didn't want to offend by that at this point. I'm sorry. I'm trying, alright? I'm making an honest attempt. <laughs> And it's about six criminals who kidnap some rich guy's daughter to hold her for ransom for 500 million? Was it 50 million? It was some mm. amount of money. It was some non insignificant amount of money. And there was 50 million. So. <laughs> <laughs> then it turns out she's a vampire. Mm hmm. Which I feel bad about spoiling, but the marketing gave it away. And I've seen some arguments that the movie would have been better if they hadn't given it away. And I don't think I agree. Mm hmm. Because, on the one hand, yes, there is something to be said for not knowing what a movie is going into it. And part of the thing is, it does actually take a bit to get to the vampire twist. Right. So, in that aspect, I can understand feeling like perhaps it's a little wheel dragging. But I also think, in this instance, they actually use that time to get in some decent, if a little on-the-nose characterization of our six main characters. Mm -hmm. And, honestly, you know something funny? There was a point before the twist happened... Where I thought to myself, she doesn't even need to be a vampire. <laughs> okay. This is just clever. This is a spoiler. I'm not... Fuck. <laughs> I feel like this is a spoiler. I'm not going to go into it. Fair. So that works. Also, the cast is really good, because they've all got code names. Giancarlo Esposito is Lambert, which, considering the fact that this movie has been described as a loose reimagining of Dracula's daughter, is really funny. <laughs> Isn't the woman who's, like, in um, Lisa Frankenstein, isn't she in this? Catherine Newton, yeah, she's... So, Lambert gives the rest of the team... He says no names, and, like, how are we supposed to communicate? And he goes, okay, fine, you want names? Here you go. So, Dan Stevens is playing Frank. Okay. Melissa Barrera is Joey. Catherine Newton is Sammy. Fair. Kevin Durand is Peter. Okay. Angus Cloud, in, I believe, his final performance, because he sadly passed away is mm. Dean, and Will Catlett is, as Lambert puts it, your Don fucking Rickles. <laughs> so we're doing a whole, like, Mr. Pink thing here, then. <laughs> They've all been named after the Rat Pack. Nice. <laughs> no, it was really good. Because <laughs> <laughs> he starts naming all of them, and, and uh, Rickles ends up cluing into the fact that it's all just the Rat Pack, and he goes, you're at the forefront of pop culture, aren't you, Lambert? And you're Don fucking Rickles, all right? <laughs> Very good. It's really great. 
Alicia Ware is Abigail. She is great. She she doesn't carry this movie, but if she wasn't as good, this movie would be significantly worse because she has to carry a lot of different facets of this one character. Mm. And she does it very well. Okay. Melissa Barrera, Dan Stevens, and Catherine Newton are also all standouts. Kevin Durand, a little bit of an understated one, but he has some really good moments. Mm -hmm. And also, it's funny. This is a funny movie. Case in point, the Don fucking Rickles bit. (laughs) I can hear Giancarlo Esposito just go very, like, disappointingly and all, but still sternly, all right, you're Don fucking Rickles. Are you happy now? (laughs) Also, I don't think this one's a spoiler. I was right. I called one of the F-bombs. Oh, did you? Yeah, because when the trailer first came out and Dan Stevens goes, let's go kill us a vampire. I was like, there's, oh, yeah. there's, a, there's a fuck in there. You cut that out. There's an edited fuck bomb. <laughs> and there was. I was right. <laughs> Very good. However, I didn't catch the fact that when Catherine Newton goes, we just kidnapped a vampire, there was also a fuck in there, too. <laughs> So, I guess I'm back to zero. Aw, uh, so it balances out. <laughs> yep, checks and balances, there it is. Mm. It's interesting to watch. It, it, it's funny because it drew a little bit of comparison to Last Voyage of Demeter for me in the sense of, whereas the Last Voyage of Demeter, you're sitting there being frustrated at first because you're like, what the fuck, why are you guys, oh right, you don't know what a vampire is yet. Here, <laughs> once they realize they're dealing with a vampire, they immediately start going over what they think they know about vampires. So that's mm-hmm. both good and also lends itself to some really funny things. I imagine they get proven wrong more than once. <laughs> with a few different ones, yeah. Oh, nice. I only wrote down a couple of the lines in here, and one of them I'm not going to give away because it's not its not really a spoiler, but mm-hmm. mm, you, you know what? Uh, no context. Sammy, those are fucking onions. <laughs> okay. Sure. <laughs> no, this this is an interesting movie. The production design is great. The the mm. building where they're all holed up is sufficiently spooky, creepy mansion-esque. Right. Which lends itself very well to that environment. There's a couple of moments that are genuinely horrifying to watch in terms of gore factor. Oh, boy. So that's neat. <laughs> but... It's kind of funny, because when you said Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare has some of its best stuff at the end, that's kind of the opposite of Abigail. Oh, really? Yeah, no, Abigail has a situation where, in the final 20 minutes or so, it really started losing me. Ah, uh, that's that's sad. It's always sad when it's like, you have this good lead-up, and then it's like, ah, uh, and we... It's like, okay, I think they might have run out of ideas. <laughs> they fumbled the bag a little bit, and it's even more frustrating, because... Okay, full disclosure for anybody who doesn't already know, I am a movie enthusiast in a casual sense, leaning, yeah, I will watch some artsier stuff, but some of my favorite movies are still superhero movies and horror and what have you, and Mm -hmm. I don't know what goes into making a movie beyond fun trivia that I like to look up. I don't know about camera techniques, I don't really know about production processes and the steps of it. All I know is what I've accumulated over doing some light reading for a few years. So, in that sense, I am not an expert. Most of my creative endeavors, the longest running thing I've got is a stupid screen cap comic, so (laughs) I'm almost an amateur writer. But it's not stupid. No, it's absolutely (laughs) stupid. That's why I like doing it. Fair. Things can be stupid and good. Case in point, hundreds of beavers. I mean, you that's also you brilliant, me. but... It's also brilliant. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> you should go watch it after wa- listening to our show. <laughs> yeah, and then watching Abigail. No, wait, watch Hundreds of Beavers first, actually. Yes, yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah. No, but the thing is, because I consider myself quote-unquote an amateur writer, I think I can see some of the strings behind what happened here. Or it could be my own biases, because, again, I'm an amateur are coloring my own process. You take from it whatever you want. But my takeaway Mm. is one of two things happened with the ending of the movie. Okay. Either one, they realized that the studio was never going to let them get away with hiding the fact that she's a vampire. Mm. So they decided they needed more twists to keep interest. Or maybe the studio demanded it. I don't know. Or they realized that they had a specific ending for certain characters in mind, 
and that ending wasn't entirely congruous with where the movie was at, so they tried to cram something into the end of it that would help get to that point. And it doesn't not work, Mm. but it also is far from seamless. Mm. You can see the cracks. You can see where the end is kind of straining to hold itself together. Hmm. Okay. And then also there's a thing at the end that happens that's very uncanny looking, and I just, <laughs> I'm not a huge fan. Is it Nicolas Cage? <laughs> okay, it's not a spoiler to say it's it's not Nicolas Cage, because that's just a yeah. dumb idea I had. <laughs> yeah, I was to say, it's like, that would be something. <laughs> me. Is this cool to say it's not Nicolas Cage? Me. Nobody was fucking expecting Nicolas Cage except me. <laughs> Nobody. Mm. So no, Abigail... Abigail is good. And it's still... Even the ending doesn't tank it. The ending's just not as sharp as I felt the rest of the movie was. Mm. Which is really disappointing considering how many fangs are flying around. Uh, you're proud of that one, aren't you? I'm a little <laughs> proud of that one, yeah. <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna do a spoiler section. Alrighty. Because you didn't do one, and I feel like it would be a little, uh... Go see this. Yes. Just go see this movie. It Go see both of these movies. Yeah. Because this one, I will say, it's still in my top ten of 2024 at the moment, at least. But it's mm-hmm. it's at number ten, so the odds are one more sufficiently ah. good movie is going to knock it out. Fair. Although, also to be fair, I have some 2023 and 2022 movies in here, just based on when they got a wider release. <laughs> she has a say. It's like, it needs to be said, because the movie only... Oh, wait, no, but that's... we. That's right, we're not going to say anything more about Hundreds of Beavers. <laughs> I mean, Hundreds of Beavers is a 2022 film, technically, and that's at the top of my list. Yeah. It's... That actually knocked Lisa Frankenstein off the top spot. Was not expecting that. Oh, 100%. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> Thinking about it, boy, if I had a nickel for every 2024 horror comedy starring Catherine Newton with connections to a classic universal horror monster, I'd have two nickels. It's not a lot, but it's weird that it's happened twice. I want six nickels. <laughs> you think she has the chops for it? Yes. <laughs> Very good. Yes, I do. I think that about wraps it up for this week. Alrighty. Next week, we got a few different options again, it looks like. Fortunately, I'm not as busy, but next week, we have either Boy Kills World. Mm-hmm. We got Challengers. Right. And there's something else called Unsung Hero, but... Based on a remarkable true story, you lost me. <laughs> Let's look into this a little bit. Unsung Hero follows David Smallbone as he moves his family from down under to the state searching for- American Christian drama film. Yeah, you lost me. <laughs> Wait, what? American Christian drama film. Yeah, oh, you yep, lost no, me. Oh, yep, no, I'm out. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's either Challengers or Boy Kills World. Yeah, I think I'm leaning towards Boy Kills World. I'm probably leaning more towards Challengers, but I might try to see both this time. Mm-hmm. In any case, thanks so much for listening, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and sitting through our inane rambles. I feel like neither of us were on our... <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> ...description A game this week. But I hope mm. you got some laughs out of it anyway, because ultimately that's what it's all about. Right. In any case, regardless of what we cover next week, we will be back next week. This has been Under the Bridge with Cody, a.k.a. the Scarlet Troll. And with Greg, a.k.a. Greg. And we'll see you guys next time. Goodbye, everybody. Bye!